Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. Well, good morning, church family. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 30. We're continuing our walk through our sermon series uh, that the cross has spoken, the, the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. How many of you have seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? Incredible movie, I highly recommend it to you. It's a true story, uh, based on a true story, about uh, a World War II uh, army medic, uh, Desmond T. Doss, who served in the Pacific and uh, was a conscientious objector. As a medic, he went into battle without even carrying a rifle. He would become the first American soldier in history to win the Medal of Honor without ever firing a shot. At the Battle of Okinawa, <clears throat> his unit gets pushed back off what they called Hacksaw Ridge, and they were down at the base uh, up against the beach and the shore. <clears throat> um, but Doss stayed behind enemy lines. Even though the unit had been pushed back, too many of the American soldiers had been wounded and left behind. And Doss stayed behind as a medic, going to each one of them and rescuing them and lowering them down the ridge, saving somewhere between 50 to 100 wounded men of certain death. Now, all the while, Doss was wounded four times during this rescue, taking a sniper's bullet through his left arm. And at one point, <clears throat> he had 17 pieces of shrapnel embedded in his body after kicking a grenade away from himself and his comrades right before it exploded. Colossians 1.13 says that God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. This means that Christ rescued you from behind enemy lines and that he carried you safely into his kingdom. But beloved, Satan did not go down without a fight. Have you ever wondered why it was that Christ suffered such a gruesome death? It was because the fury of hell was unleashed upon him. The rulers, the powers, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places waged all out war. We've walked through over the last several weeks from Jesus' arrest that he, was, he, he received attack after attack, shame and relentless abuse, physical, emotional, and even spiritual. And last week, if you weren't here, we contemplated the greatest suffering in history that not only was Jesus forsaken by the Jewish leaders and his government and the crowd and even his very own disciples, forsaken, abandoned by each group, but last week we waded into the waters of Jesus being forsaken by God the Father for three hours on the cross as Jesus became the curse for our sin. Darkness rolled in as a sign of judgment, judgment upon Jesus as he drank the cup of our sin. 
Beloved, I do not have words to express what Jesus endured by being forsaken by his Father. The active wrath of God, the fury of hell upon him. But this I know, it frees me for eternity. This is where we are going this morning, asking the question, what did Jesus accomplish for us on the cross? So listen, as I read John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. Uh, This this first part is a previous saying uh, of Jesus on the cross. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. We covered that a couple weeks ago. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. And so put it on a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have come before you this morning and before your word and and now we contemplate the cross. The cross where you have revealed yourself, where you have revealed your character and your nature to us through the giving and the sacrifice of your son. Father, it is good for us to pause and to contemplate deeply, to think well and right and long about the cross. About what it says about you and who you are that you are holy, that there is no God like you, but you are also loving, and you would rather be glorified by your mercy and your love over and against your wrath. Father, if there is anyone here this morning that does not know you, I pray that they would come to faith that they would see and understand, comprehend your magnificent and holy love on the cross of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if we're honest, our lives are filled with unfinished business and projects, all right? How many of you have a pile of half-read books at home, all right? They're just half-read. You get about three chapters in, and that's about as far as you get. Half-eaten meals in the fridge, piles of laundry, half-built model cars, half-sewn quilts, a half-finished basement. I know your honeydew list is about half done. There are important conversations that we've been putting off, confessions that we've been hiding, forgiveness that we've been withholding reconciliation that we've been avoiding. Well, here's the good news, friend. Jesus did not leave the great mission of his life unfinished. No, he cried out, he shouted out from the cross, it is finished. Now, in the Greek, this is one word, tetelestai, it is finished. Meaning, it has been completed. This is a very rich word, to tetelestai, in the Greek. It means that Christ fulfilled all the way to the end, everything required of him, reaching the goal of it is accomplished. Spurgeon aptly put it, that Jesus shouted one word, to tetelestai, And it requires all other words to explain it. What did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? Well, first, this morning, we would say that Christ completed and fulfilled the law. 
John 17, verse 4, Jesus says, God, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished, that's the word, to tell us that, accomplished the work which you have given me to do. That is, all the tasks, all of it that was expected of him, all that God wanted of him, he accomplished. Or again, in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Simply put, Jesus' entire life fulfilled the law of God to perfection. The law is God's standard and expectation on every human being. How we ought to act, how we must act if we are to be in fellowship with a holy God. But let's face it, when you and I come up against the law of God, we only see our shortcomings. When Jesus says it is finished, he means that his entire life was lived in complete obedience to God's standard. Now think about what I just said. His entire life lived in complete obedience to God's standard. Let's just start with that, with that final part, God's standard. Measured against the holiness of God. Not your neighbor and not your cousin and and not your dad. You see, it's human nature to tell ourselves that deep down we find ourselves to be good people. And we concentrate on areas of our life where we excel and we consider ourselves to be better than others. And so we look around and we're like, you know what? I'm not that bad. I'm a pretty good guy. But friend, you will not be compared to them. God is the standard. God's holiness. God's perfection. And Jesus lived his entire life in complete obedience to God's standard. Everything he did Everything he said, did you know that John chapter 12 verse 49 says that Jesus only spoke what the Father wanted him to say? Every intention of his heart, no lust, no unrighteous anger, no envy, no jealousy, no hatred, no addiction to stuff. Truly human, tempted in every way, yet no self-loathing, no sinful anxiety or doubt. This is the book of Jesus' life, his book of perfection, that everything he ever did, thought or said has been written in his book. Now, his book is not filled with any of the things that God tells us not to do, right? Many of the things I've listed, none of those are in here. But did you also know that his book is filled with all of the righteous deeds that God expects of us? Here's what I would tell you. Half of the sins that you and I commit are sins of things that we ought not to do, but we do them anyways. We declare ourselves to be the king or queen. But the other half of the sins that you and I commit are sins of laziness and passivity. We do not do all that God calls us to. We do not love our neighbor. We do not seek God as he is worthy, but not Jesus. His entire book is filled with his righteous deeds. So that when he cried out from the cross, when he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. 
What he had finished was completing this book, an entire life lived to perfection. Now, I developed this object lesson, this illustration for children, and I always ask the question, if this is your life, where do you deserve to go? You can answer this part. Where did Jesus deserve to go? Heaven. And why is that? Well, because he's perfect. Because he's earned it. This is his life. So now here's the question. Because this sermon is about to take a sharp turn into a press. And it's going to feel like I'm attacking you. But hear me, I'm not. I am in the very same boat that you are. I'm speaking about every one of us outside of Jesus Christ. Before we ever came to faith in him. And hear me, this press comes from God himself. So here's the question, why the cross? Why the cross? Man's view of the cross is that it is completely unnecessary. Yeah, sure, maybe Jesus is needed as a band-aid, a a little cover over for the handful of times that we have been sinful. But certainly we don't need anything as drastic as the cross to be forgiven. In terms of the book, we think that our book is 85, 90%, you know, good stuff. And we might need Jesus to just cover over a little bit, that last 10%. Now, to give you an illustration, you are out to sea in a boat, and the boat is crashed due to your mistake, due to your sin. This is how most people view themselves. You are aware of the dire situation, and you pull out your emergency kit. You signal on the radio that you're in an emergency and you would like some help. You pull out the flare gun, you shoot those off, and you wait to see if anyone's coming, and then you begin to swim as hard as you can back to the shore. And you swim, and you swim, and you swim, and and you are still a little ways off, and you realize you can't make it back to the shore. But then Jesus throws out a lifesaver and pulls you in. This is how most people view their need for Jesus. Yeah, I struggled in my sin, I fought hard, I was about 80 to 90% of the way there, and thank God for Jesus, who covered the other 10%. Friend, this is where Christianity is at complete odds with your pride and your sense of self-goodness. The Bible does not say that you are mostly good with a little bit of bad that needs covering over. The Bible does not call you innocent and that you learned a few bad habits along the way. Now, the Bible takes aim, square at your pride, and says, you are dead in your sins. That your book, remember God's standard. Remember who you're compared to. That your book, every thought you've ever had, lust and anger and envy and jealousy, your sinful anxiety and unbelief, every careless word, not to mention your laziness and your passivity, Let me put it another way so that you will hear me. You do not love God. There is none righteous, not even one. And God's standard is perfection. To be guilty of breaking one law is to be guilty of breaking the whole. But you don't have to worry about that because you can't go one day without sinning. And so your book is filled with millions and millions of sins. 
To go back to the boat analogy, the way the Bible describes your situation is that you are miles off in the sea of your sin. That you are wrecked there because of your sin and you have sunk to the bottom of the ocean. That you are not radioing in that you are not shooting off flares or trying to swim back to shore. Rather, you have drowned in the sea of your sin and you are dead. You are helpless, completely helpless at the bottom. No hope without life. The Bible actually says that you are enemy of God. There is none who seeks for him. No, not one. And you are destined to be separated from God for eternity. I know that doesn't register in our minds, right? We can barely think past today. Listen to God's words separated from him for eternity. You see, in the strongest possible terms, your situation is dire. It is desperate. It is all-encompassing. And there is only one solution, the cross. It is finished, Jesus declared from the cross. His entire life lived to perfection. Friend, hear me. The offer of the cross is a complete replacement, a complete exchange, not a partial cover over the 10% that you think you need, that you need 100% of Jesus' life and righteousness, and anything else is insufficient. That is the offer of the cross. Secondly, When Jesus cried, it is finished, he means that he was finished drinking the cup of your sin. Jesus doesn't just gift you his perfect life. He had to pay the full price for your sin before a holy God. You see, for three hours, darkness rolled over the land as Jesus hung on the cross Signifying that Jesus had become the curse of God. That Jesus had become your sin. Forsaken by his father. He cried out from the cross in the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cannot describe to you what it was like for the eternal son to be forsaken by his father for three hours on the cross. I cannot comprehend the fury of hell as he drank wave after wave of my sin. Further still, the sins of the world. Envy and jealousy and hatred and lust and murder and greed and slander. But that forsakenness did not last forever. That cup eventually ran out. And at the end of it, Jesus rose up on the cross and shouted, it is finished. I need to teach you one of the most important theological words in the universe. Propitiation. Okay, propitiation. The Bible says that Jesus was the propitiation for our sin. Now, it comes from the Latin word propitio. I know that doesn't help you much, right? But it means to appease or satisfy the wrath of. 
In pagan religions, this is the scene where the gods have become angry and furious and volatile, and, and the only way that they think that they can appease God, the gods is, is to take a virgin and, and throw her into this rumbling volcano, and then the sacrifice is accepted and the gods are at peace. You say, wait a second, preacher, what an awful description to talk about God. That God has a wrath? Like God's volatile, and he has these massive mood swings, and he's on the verge of a temper tantrum. Just watch out for God's wrath. Well, the first thing to say about God's wrath is that it is part of the gospel. It is the part we tend to ignore. Yet we don't mind our own anger. You know, there's a lot of anger in us. A lot of righteous indignation. Just listen to cable news or your favorite podcast or read the indignation on social media. Our anger is our entertainment. But the thought of God being angry, well, who does he think he is? Well, great question. Who is God? He is the most balanced, perfect personality imaginable. His wrath is not some irrational outburst. It is his justified response to our exchange of a relationship with him and our evil destroying of whatever he loves. You see, God is not a passive observer. He is jealous for you. He is personally involved. His wrath flows out of his love and his holiness. The Bible says God is love, and it declares that God is holy. It never says that God is anger or God is wrath. But it couldn't say that God is love without his anger. And it couldn't say that God is holy without his wrath because God's anger shows how serious his love and his holiness are. Think about it like this. How should a husband feel about the cancer that's killing his wife? But don't miss this point because in human religions... It's the worshiper who placates the offended deity with rituals and sacrifices and bribes. But in the gospel, it is God himself who provides the offering. On the cross of Christ, God put something forward. God presented and he, and he satisfied his own wrath through the death of his son that all of God's holy hatred towards your sin, that all of his wrath towards your disobedience, your treason, your hatred of him, that all of it, Jesus shouted, it is finished. As he drank every single last drop. As one commentator noted, the word to telestai would be written at the bottom of a receipt or a certificate of debt. A certificate of debt is, is a list of all the financial charges that are held against you, a list of all that you owe. In the ancient world, there was no bankruptcy. If you got into financial hardship, you had to sell yourself in your, and your debts into slavery, into indentured servanthood. You, you had to make yourself a slave, and they would write out a list of your financial obligations, all that you owed, a certificate of debt. And then you'd have to work towards that to pay it off. But when it got paid off, 
finally and fully paid off when there was no longer debt and the freedom had been purchased, they would write to Telestai over the note. It is finished. It has come to completion. In other words, paid in full. You see, when Jesus shouted Titelestai from the cross, he was shouting, paid in full. That the wrath of God against your sin had been paid in full. That no further payment was needed. That the debt had been paid. Set this prisoner free. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a savior. What a far cry from my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What a far plea from I am thirsty. Guys, this is a shout of victory. Because Jesus now knows that it has all been accomplished and he is ready to lay down his life. Jesus knows that the entirety of the law has been fulfilled to perfection. It is finished. Jesus knows that he has drunk the full wrath of our sin and that the wrath of God has been appeased. It is finished. Jesus knows. But friend, do you know Do you know that it is finished means that you cannot add even one good work to it? Because to add to it is to disfigure it. Imagine if I added my own art to the Sistine Chapel. See, there's my work, right? There next to Michelangelo's. You see, anything I add is to disfigure it. And you don't have to worry. I'm not very good at art. It would be like a stick figure. It would be awful. It would dis- disfigure it. You see, the offer from the cross is 100% of Jesus' righteousness by faith alone. You see, salvation is by grace alone. Through faith alone, in Jesus alone. See, either he accomplished all on your behalf, or friend, he has accomplished nothing. There is no penance that you can undergo, no good work that you can perform, no pilgrimage that you can embark, no punishment that you can endure to clear your guilt before God. Friend, hear me clearly. What are you believing this morning? Because Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply To the cross I cling. Finally, Jesus knows that he has drunk the full wrath of God for our sin. And he shouts, it is finished. Jesus knows, but friend, do you know that all who are in Jesus, that God is fixed in his disposition towards you. That if you are in Christ, you are a child of God. That you are covered completely in his righteousness. And God calls you his own. And this is his fixed disposition towards you. Let me state it to you plainly. He's not mad at you.
He's not mad at you. He gave his son for you. He has no anger or wrath at all towards you. It is finished. He is completely satisfied in the death of his son for your sin. And therefore, he is for you. And he calls you his own. This week, I was trying to think about the best way to to be able to illustrate that to you. I was having a day where I was, I was just in a funk. It's been gloomy all week. That affects me. And I haven't been particularly patient with my kids and haven't been particularly faithful in my quiet time, right? And here I am trying to illustrate how I'm going to do this at the end of sermon, right? That's the peril of being a pastor. And in that moment, in the midst of that funk, I thought... It is finished even in my funk. That God's disposition towards me is that he is completely satisfied in his son. That he views me as his own. That he is for me even in this dreary state. Even in my downcast, can't see straight, there's a cloud over my head. That he is for me because it is finished. And wouldn't you know it, in that moment, in that thought, the clouds rolled away. The fog lifted. It was like a reset button. And then I said, well, that's the most practical thing that I could say to any of us, right? Amen? That it is finished. So on your worst day, it is finished. And on your best day, it is finished. When you sleep in and when you skip your Bible reading, it is finished. And when you are faithful to spend hours on your knees in prayer, it is finished. When you explode in unbridled anger, it is finished. And when you exhibit Christ-like patience, it is finished. And when your lust takes you down a dark road of betrayal, it is finished. And when you learn to control your desires, and your passions, it is finished. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there is no God like you. You are the one. You are the only. There is no other. You are magnificent and holy. You dwell in unapproachable light. The cross declares that you are perfect in all of your ways, that you give justice. God, that you hate sin, that you hate attacks on your character. God, that that you will not leave the guilty unpunished. The The cross declares all of that. And the cross declares that you are full of love and mercy, that you would rather be glorified by your love and mercy than your wrath. And that you are a God who draws near, draws near to each of us, that you have given your son so that we might know you and we might walk with you. Father, if there is anyone here this morning, I pray right now, if they do not know you, God, that they would cry out in faith. That they would hear what you have done on their behalf on the cross. That they would place all of their faith, all of their hope, all of their trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and him and him alone. And Father, that you would save. Friend, if that is you, cry out to him right now. Just say, save me. I believe, I trust in your finished work on the cross that you died for my sin. 
Father, for those of us that do know you, Father, I did that more than 25 years ago. And the cross continues to be good news for me. That you view me now, even still, through the lens of the finished work of Jesus. That he is our rest, that he is our hope. That we have no other. And that you view us as a son and a daughter. And that you're not mad. But you have full delight in us as your own. Father, I pray that you would set some people free this morning who continually walk in a cloud of guilt and shame, who continually feel that you are angry with them. May they hear these words, it is finished. And may they appropriate what Jesus has done. Take hold of it. Set them free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.